I'm Davia Brown. I'm Brandon Lyles. And I'm Stacy Loveland. And we're excited to have you join us for Colonial Williamsburg's CW Kids Ask. Where we dive deep into history. Together, we'll explore 18th century life and connect it to present day experiences. We'll look at everything from fashion to science. And economy to archeology. span We'll take a closer look at our past and present. Join us each month on our live streams and submit your own questions. Or watch past episodes and start your own conversations. The past has something for everyone. So come join us. As we discover the past. How did colonial government work? In Virginia, we lay our scene to houses of great power. The Burgesses and Council meet to make our people prouder. In 1619, the Assembly met beneath the Jamestown steeple, the first of its kind in America to represent the people. Good young king, Farmer George, rules from Mother England, along with the Board of Trade to keep us in the king's hand. The Burgesses elected men who write and bleat and ponder, debate the laws that bring us peace, and all is a great wonder. The council is appointed here to serve the governor's pleasure. They are the rich and privileged few who guide us in this venture. Good young king, Farmer George, rules from Mother England, along with the Board of Trade to keep us in the king's hand. The king appoints the governor who then directs the assembly. He is the royal leader here, somewhere a wee bit bumbly. His council sits in judgment for the courts they hold command or presiding o'er the crimes we fear and bringing victims closure. Good young king, Farmer George, rules from Mother England, along with the Board of Trade who keep us in the king's hand. For many years the system reigned, it kept the people happy. Things began to fall apart when England got all taxi. We did away with monarchy, we gained our independence, we adopted much the same government, and you can see the resemblance. Poor mad king, Farmer George, ruled from Mother England, along with the Board of Trade who lost us as a king's land. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for this episode of CW Kids Ask. This is our monthly live stream just for students where we will explore 18th century life and learn about the people, events, and ideas that helped shape America. Each month we will bust some myths and misconceptions, explore primary sources, and answer questions that you sent to us in the chat. I'm Davia Brown, and today we're going to answer the question, how did the colonial government work? Joining me today from the chamber of the House of Burgesses and the Capitol Building, the seat of Virginia's colonial government, we have Kathleen McDonough, Maya Ravegno, and Linwood Tyson. Let's get started by having you tell us a bit about yourselves. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Kathleen McDonough. I have been working for Colonial Williamsburg for about 10 years and I'm very much enjoying looking forward to the questions that you may have about colonial government today. Hello, my name is Lynn Wood. I've been working here for 20 years. I'm so glad you could join us today and we're here to have some, some fun. Thank you for joining us. Hi everyone, my name's Maya and I've been working for Colonial Williamsburg for almost six years. I'm so excited to talk with you about government today and hear your questions. Thank you all for being here. I want to start by asking a very important question. What does government mean and what is it supposed to do? But government is an opportunity for us to understand that you must be governed. And so when you think about government, you must have a system that allows us to govern ourselves, govern the people, but also give people the rights as well. And so we think about government, we think of the word govern. How do we govern ourselves? Well, think about your schools. There are principals, there are teachers, and there's always some rules there to make sure that everybody there is enjoying themselves, but also learning in a safe environment. That's what government does. So to carry on on that, government sets the structure for our society. So government, much like Linwood said, with like schools, 
we have a system that helps us regulate our lives and puts laws in place for the safety of the community. The, the role of government really is to keep the people safe, to allow them an outlet to express their thoughts, and then uh, create change. The work of government is really never done. I think those are all some really good answers. Uh, let's talk about the structure of the colonial government of Virginia. At the top of government is the king or queen. Who's next? Um, so after the king and queen, you're going to have um, various groups of people really in the colonial government. Um, there's the Board of Trade, which we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes. Um, it's a group of people that's meant to advise the king or the queen at the time about what's going on in every single part of the British Empire, whether it's a territory or a colony, really. Uh, there are also counselors. Mm -hmm. um, the Privy Council are the king's or queen's closest advisors and trusted friends and allies. Uh, there are also other ministers. Uh, the prime minister is the most important. He's the person to be relied on to keep the government running smoothly and to make sure every person has a voice that's going to be heard. And uh, what is Parliament? So Parliament is the legislative body over in England. So here in America, we have the House of Representatives as well as the Senate. We have the upper and lower house. In England, they have Parliament, which is made up of the lower house, the House of Commons, as well as the upper house, which is the House of Lords. We have an uh, image of that actually on our screen now. Uh, would you tell us a bit about that there? And certainly what's most important about Parliament, just like in our government, you have to work together. So in, here in Virginia, we have what is called a General Assembly. In Parliament, as Maya has shared with us, the upper house is the House of Lords, and the other house is the House of Commons. And they both have to come together to an agreement to introduce bills that become law. Very good. Uh, Kathleen, you had mentioned the Board of Trade uh, briefly, so uh, would you tell us a bit more about what was the role of the Board of Trade? Um, the Board of Trade uh, is first established in the 1600s. Um, it's a group of people that are going to be advisors to the king about a particular territory or a colony. Um, they're going to make recommendations based on what's going on in the colony every day, week, month, year, and what have you. Um, they are also going to inform the king about the business of what needs to be done. Um, what letters do we need to send? Do we need to make new laws? They're, they're basically um, the second step between communication with the king and the people overall. And when you think about government, there's another important G word that goes with that, which is governor. So would you mm -hmm. tell us what the role of the governor is? So the governor is here to represent the king. And because the king can't be everywhere at once, so he's over in England, but for example, just here in North America, he had 13 colonies. So something might need attention in Massachusetts and here in Virginia and then in North Carolina and then back to England. The king really can't attend to all of those matters at once. So he appoints a representative to come here to Virginia and represent him. So while the governor doesn't have all the same powers of the king, he's got quite a few of them. Indeed. And to add to that, Think about that royal governor who's coming here. He becomes a commander in chief of the entire colony. So he has all of that authority that's been given to him from the king. And now that he's here, he's the commander in chief of everything, the military and everything, because we are all British subjects before 1776. Now, do you think if he had managed to master the power of cloning, he might have been able to handle all that? <laughs> I think so, but then you have to worry about the evil clone situation. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's I always true. forget that part. Good point. Um, so in the song, uh, and also on that little image that we have breaking down the uh, structure of government, uh, who was the governor's council and what did they do? The governor's council are men 
that are chosen by the royal governor, but they are appointed by the king. So again, we have that relationship between the colony and the king, which is over in England, and that's that far away distance. And so to have the king input here, the royal governor will say, I'm going to choose some men that represent the colony, in this case, the colony of Virginia. And those men will be very wealthy Virginians. And they will serve for life. Can you imagine? For life. And they're serving in their judicial, executive, and legislative responsibilities. Remember, we're still a colony, and it doesn't happen until 1776. A lot of, oh, sorry. Yep. No, nope. oh, good. So, something you mentioned about the governor's, the, excuse me, the governor's council job in the executive branch. And part of that job is that they are helping to advise the governor because, well, we mentioned earlier, the governor's from England. He doesn't quite know how we do things here in Virginia. Mm. So, they're the ones to be able to go, hey, <laughs> just so you know, for next time, <laughs> this is how we do things here. We all need people like that in our lives. <laughs> um, but that's a lot of power to think about um, being in the executive, the judicial, and the legislative, making laws, enforcing laws, judging on th uh, matters of the law. Um, and then we also have uh, burgesses as well to help with that. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what the burgesses did? Um, the burgesses are a group that's elected, um, usually for Virginia. Every county will vote for two burgesses to represent it. Um, Major cities get one Burgess. So they'll gather here on the right side of the Capitol building and they will make the laws and they'll be responsible for other aspects of government too. Um, they're making sure the roads are in good shape. Uh, if they need to you know, pay attention to other details in government, if they can't get it done on a regular day's worth of work, um, they'll go upstairs in the Capitol building and meet us like breakout groups of about 10 to 15 people, uh, and we call those groups committees. We are in now the House of Burgesses. Yes. <laughs> and so when you look around this room, you see all these portraits of kings and queens. Well, again, this is the way that it looked when George Washington and Thomas Jefferson sat here. <laughs> and they would have been surrounded by all of these portraits to remind us of the authority of the king. And I'm sitting next to the speaker's chair. And the speaker would be the person who's elected by all of those men who are sitting here. And one of the speakers was Peyton Randolph. And imagine these men sitting here, and they, all of them sitting, will decide to choose Peyton Randolph to sit in that big chair. So that means he has a whole lot of authority. And one of my favorite things about the speaker's chair is that is the original speaker's chair from the 18th century. So we don't have great luck with our capitals here in Virginia. They tend to burn down pretty frequently. But when the first capital burns down, some people rush inside to get the speaker's chair. And that's how it gets saved from the fire. You both, uh, all three of you have hit on some very important points about the you know, the weight of this room, I mean, this is not the original Capitol building, but this room that we're in currently here on the right side of the building is where those famous burgesses such as George Washington and Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson actually sat and helped make that uh, happen. What we have on the screen is also an image of our Capitol uh, building there, our reconstructed Capitol. But um, since this building didn't last to the 21st century, um, was the government structure from the 18th century um, the same for all of the American colonies? Um, there are certain uh, similarities, Davia, but there are also really big differences between uh, the 13 colonies. I tend to think of them as 13 pieces of a very unique puzzle fitting together. Um, originally, when the 13 colonies are founded in various points in time, um, they're usually put into one of three categories. Uh, you can talk about a, a royal colony. Uh, a royal colony is run by the crown, uh, which consists of the king or the queen, a group of people like those counselors, the prime minister, other important government officials, um, and they're in charge of picking the governor and the council, like what we've been talking about here for just a little bit. 
Um, there's charter colonies, um, charters like Massachusetts, uh, who have a piece of paper that's given to them by the crown, but whoever has the piece of paper and who's living in the charter colony gets to choose the laws. Um, not every colony is the same as each other, no matter if it's a royal colony, a charter colony. There's also a proprietary colony. And a proprietor is someone who is given a massive amount of land. But when that person or group is given that, they're choosing the governor. They're choosing the counselors, the people in the government. Um, a proprietary colony, though, is a little tricky because you have to have a lot of steps to get from the proprietor to the king to parliament. Um, think about sending a message in your classroom uh, to your best friend who's across the hall, but you can't move from where you're sitting. Uh, you're gonna have to pass that message to so many people. Uh, not a lot of people like those extra steps because it's too much work. So proprietary colonies by the 1770s, there's not a lot of them. They're mostly royal or charter colonies. And Kathleen, think about this. Wherever they're from, wherever you folks who are watching this out there, you have to discover whether or not you were one of those colonies. Were you one of the royal colonies? Uh, were you a proprietary colony? Or whether maybe you were a charter colony? Now, some of you understand that some of you weren't even a part of this idea of, of, of what we call the British Empire. So you need to ask your teacher or ask your parents, you know, um, if I'm from Florida, am I Spanish or am I British? <laughs> uh, and so you have to understand that not all, we only have 13, so we have to decide what colony would you come from? Like Virginia is a royal colony. Royal yep. colony. See? Royal so where are we at? This is, this is, this is Virginia. And Kathleen mentioned Massachusetts is, what does she say? A charter colony. A charter colony, <laughs> see? So there's a difference. And so what you have to do is to go back, ask someone, look it up for yourselves, and discover, well, what, what would I have been if I was here in the 18th century? I think you may have get, just given some kids their homework assignment. <laughs> oh, indeed. I like doing that. You can tell. Yes. That's yes. a really good point you bring up, Linwood, because yes. in the 21st century and in the 18th century, yes. there's a lot of diversity. You've got people from different parts of Europe that are in these uh, so-called British colonies. You've got Indeed. American Indians who were here in the 18th century and many still here today. Um, I mean, even when it comes to geographics, some states now were technically part of other English colonies in the 18th century. So you could be in Ohio and think, oh, we weren't a royal colony, but for those of you watching from Ohio, you're technically Virginians in the 18th century. Um, congratulations. And we sorry welcome you back home. <laughs> you welcome home. But um, that brings us to our next question. Um, with all that diversity in the 18th century and the colonial era, uh, who was actually able to participate in government? Well, voting is not a right like we think of it today. Voting in the 18th century is considered a privilege. So to be able to vote for one of your elected representatives in government, you need to be a free white man over the age of 21 who is a member of the Church of England or a registered Protestant dissenter. So remember, there's no separation between church and state yet, as well as you need to own the minimum required amount of property. Now that's just to vote. Those restrictions will increase if you want to run for office. That excludes a lot of people. <laughs> but also religion is important. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't want any Roman Catholics uh, voting either. They, you know, we <laughs> want to mention that. I hope I'm not offending any Roman Catholics out there. But remember that this was set up in a way by those men who are here, who are Virginians. And sometimes they didn't always include everybody. So they have restrictions restrictions that we hopefully will remove. I think we've, we've progressed somewhat. Uh, actually, not even somewhat, quite a bit. Um, but it's still not 100% mm. representation, uh, which is, makes sense for humans. We don't always get it right the first time. But uh, we're starting to get some great questions in from our viewers. And on representation, one viewer asks, what does no taxation without representation mean? Well, it simply means this. As Virginians, we've always had taxes. Taxes just won't go away. Now, you young folks out there, you might not have an opportunity to talk about taxes, so I'm going to leave that to your mother and others to explain <laughs> that to you. 
But when we mean taxes, we mean that you have representation. So all of these Virginians who are sitting here, they represent their constituents, meaning those who could vote. And so they're going to come up with their own taxes. It might be on alcohol. It might be in imported goods. It could be on tobacco. It could be on everything. And so when we have these taxes that come out of the, what we call the French and Indian War, we have to understand that those taxes are coming from Great Britain. For the first time, these men cannot decide what the taxes should be, and instead, it's coming from England. And when it comes from England, they say, taxes without representation. We have no one in Parliament, and so therefore, we are not going to pay those taxes. And Linwood, we had tried as Virginians, and I know a few other colonies and their representatives had written letters to Parliament and the King, Indeed we did. Um, hoping to have someone able to go to England and to be our voice. But all of those attempts were very unsuccessful. So before England had basically asked us, hey, we need this much money can you raise that in taxes? But now, instead of asking us, England is telling us these are the taxes we're going to pay. And that certainly makes a big difference, doesn't it? Does. It does. Yeah, when someone tells telling you, you, you do as it. to asking you. <laughs> exactly, Indeed. big difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Barbara is asking if Virginia was the only colony with the House of Burgesses in the 18th century. Mm. In terms of the name, the House of Burgesses, um, I believe we are the only one with that specific word, um, but there are others in the 13 colonies who are referring to their respective legislative bodies or those lawmakers um, as a general assembly, mm -hmm. meaning that both the upper house of lawmakers and the lower house, that's the term general assembly that's used for when they come together, for when they're compromising and doing what's best for most people in the colony and its bounds. And the word house of Burgesses, it comes from an old Latin term. Mm -hmm. And remember, they're bringing all of these languages over with them. Mm -hmm. And the Burgesses simply means a citizen of a barrow, those who have the municipal rights to vote. Mm -hmm. And so it's an old term, but think about this. When we march into a revolution and we are going to move, remove the word House of Burgesses. Do you know what we call ourselves here in Virginia? What do we call ourselves? The House of Delegates. Delegates. Mm -hmm. And what do we call ourselves today? The House of Representatives. Representatives. So this whole idea of people having opportunity to vote is coming from that old ideal coming from England. And all we are doing is just continuing that process. Yeah. So the word itself is an old word, but it means you have the right to vote. With that idea that so much of what we have now in terms of our government it being just a continuation of what had come before, it really Indeed, reminds it me is. of that old Absolutely, adage. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> old adage. Um, <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> um, keep sending us in these great questions, you guys. Um, now in Williamsburg, particularly, we know that uh, about 52.4% of the population were of African descent, and mm -hmm. almost all of them were enslaved, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, so our question is, would enslaved people have ever been in the Capitol building? Well, think about this. I don't know if they would have come here in a legislative body sitting here. But long before we move, the ideal of enslaved people coming to court for a trial, it took place at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. So yes, enslaved people came here. Mm -hmm. Now when you think about enslaved people, you have to understand or think about this. Not every person here is a slave. There are so many people that are not enslaved. Folks that look like me, they weren't enslaved. So they would come to this capital, mm -hmm. and they would have a trial here as well. So the ideal is that not everyone here is a slave. Mm -hmm. There are folks of African descent, and they come to this court to have a trial just like anybody else. So not in the legislative group, because think about this. Not only did we not have enslaved people 
in here. Who else was not in this chamber? Ladies? Women. Women weren't here. So the idea that even women couldn't be here, it was only white males who could vote. Thank you for breaking that down a little bit. It helps us kind of change our view of the people in these spaces, the different reasons that they would have been here. Uh, now, one of the biggest responsibilities of the government is the legislative or creating laws. And uh, why are laws so important in both colonial and modern government? So laws really provide uh, a start to the government. Um, principles or beliefs that they have as to who should be a participant or who should be a part of this government itself. Um, it's a start, again. It's a way to build upon what's good, to make the changes that are necessary for people to be involved and to have a greater involvement in their government than what they originally start with. Um, what you were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say, just think if we didn't have laws, what would we have? total chaos. Imagine you as a person in the classroom telling mother and father, well, I don't want to do any homework ever again. And they would tell you, well, you have to do your homework, otherwise you're not going to pass to the next grade. So there has to be rules, there has to be laws, and we have to follow them. Otherwise, we'll do whatever we wish. And so laws are important and we should follow those laws. Well, on behalf of some of our viewers who are thinking, well, hey, it would be great if we had a law that we didn't have to do our homework. <laughs> um, who decides what should be a law? <laughs> so who decides what should be a law, really, is a process. Mm -hmm. So the House of Burgesses, which is our lower House of Representatives, they are the ones who are going to be introducing legislation or introducing a bill that can become a law. And that legislation can start either by something they've come up with themselves or from a petition from the community. Because just because not everyone can vote, any free person who is a British subject can petition their government. So they are going to send that petition to their representative who can draft it into legislation, introduce it here on the House floor. They're gonna argue about it because it's government. You have to argue about everything. And then they're eventually going to vote on it. If a bill passes with the majority vote, then it passes, but that's just the first step because next it has to go to our upper legislative body, which is the governor's council. And think about that question about, well, why should we have homework? Well, you know, I don't want to do any homework either. <laughs> but the problem is this. If we don't have homework and if we don't learn how to read and write and do math, what's going to happen when we become a bit older? So as we grow up, we have to make a decision. Well, I better learn a little bit so that when I get a little bit older, I have to get a job, so I want to make sure that I'm educated to do that. And so that's what laws do. Laws govern us because, as you know, if I didn't have to do any homework, I certainly wouldn't either. <laughs> so I understand your concern, but you're going to grow up one day, and when you grow up, you're going to say, well, you know, maybe I did the right thing by learning a little bit of history. Maybe I did the right thing by learning a little bit about government. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that even though we don't want to do it, I think you should ask your mom and dad whether or not it's a good idea. I don't think there's going to be an anti-homework bill uh, passed anytime soon. Thank you, Divina. Oh, darn you. it. Thank or you. fortunately, I don't know. Well, I'm not in school anymore. But, <laughs> um, but let's talk a bit more about the, um, the process of how laws get created. So you uh, take it up, Kathleen. Um, so yeah, so Maya had said that the majority of the bills or ideas hoping to become a law begin in the lower house, the House of Burgesses. Um, from there, if it passes, it goes to the governor's council, as you said. Um, if the council reviews it, they like it, then it goes to the royal governor to be signed. Now, the royal governor can still say no to that idea, but let's say he says yes. Then you're going to get that idea from the king, 
or give it to the king, I'm sorry. Um, but think about how much time that's going to take from the government in Virginia to go on a ship to London. And we're going to be waiting an awfully long time to make sure that that law is exactly passed as we want it to. But we could go through all that work and all that effort, and the king can still say no. And I think the longest I've seen that it ever took for to get a response from the king was 10 years. 10 very years, long time. That's yeah. a very long time. Oh, yeah. And not every bill becomes a law. Mm -hmm. So it has to be debated. Mm -hmm. So in both houses, you got to debate that bill before it becomes a law. It has a process it has to go through. Mm -hmm. So just because I have a wonderful ideal, let's go back to not having any homework. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's going to work. <laughs> and DeVille has already told us it's not going to pass anytime soon. I, I just said I don't so think it's going to pass. So we can debate it, but I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that each, in each chamber, like the House of Burgesses, the lower house, it has to be debated. You just can't say, well, I think it should pass. People have to have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And then the majority will rule. Yeah. Yeah, remember, at some point in history, someone had this idea for a law or a bill and they probably thought too that it wasn't going to get passed or it might not work so you never know mm -hmm. just start with your idea and go from there mm -hmm. good thing to try out in student government that no homework bill absolutely yeah. <laughs> perseverance is key <laughs> uh, are there any important laws passed in the 18th century that live on today uh, yes, for Virginia, there's a version of this law that's still around with us in 2022 that we actually got started uh, with a document from 1776. Uh, this document is called the Virginia Declaration of Rights, and when it's passed in June of 1776, I think we have an image there to look at, um, the Declaration of Rights tells us what this new, this independent Virginia is going to look like and how the government's structured. And one of the most important things we had to consider was, how do we choose a governor? And originally we had the idea that starting in 1776, we'll have one election every year and we'll pick our governor and he can serve three one-year terms or three years altogether. And then we kind of quickly realized that maybe we need to change things. Um, eventually, law that we have today, uh, and it's different in the 49 other states compared to Virginia. In most of the 50 states today, if you have a governor chosen to lead your state, they can serve a total of eight years. That will be a one, one term lasting four years and two terms altogether making the eight. Now in Virginia, when we choose our governors every four years, we can have a governor chosen serves for four years. But if they want a second term, they have to wait four years in between their first and their second term. It's a, uh, it's a word that we call a non-consecutive term. So you could be the governor here for four years, you gotta put on pause, wait another four years, and then you can run again for that same office if you want to. That is very interesting uh, when you think about uh, how a law can be passed and then changed, altered a little bit too. Mm -hmm. So it's like that's a law that was passed in 18th Another century. Another good law but it's changed. was certainly dealing with religion too, mm -hmm. you know, religious freedom. Mm -hmm. That's something that's very new. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have religious toleration. And think about this uh, men like Thomas Jefferson who introduced that bill a little later on, and he thought that you had the right to choose whatever religion you desired. But at this time, we think about the fact that there is only one religion, and that's the Church of, Church of England. Church of England. Mm -hmm. And so a law that's introduced by Thomas Jefferson takes a little while before it becomes law. But aren't we glad we have religious freedom today? Oh, yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. It's one law I hope doesn't change. <laughs> um, now, you had uh, spoken a bit about the, uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Where do we discover laws, uh, things like that, uh, from the 18th century? Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of primary sources here at Colonial Williamsburg. And my favorite of these primary sources is quite literally the laws of Virginia. We have these huge books that are every law that's passed. 
by the government since the reign of Queen Anne. We have some from before that too, but that's the ones we have in our collection. Mm -hmm. And it goes through with every law they pass in each session. So if you're looking for a specific law, it might take a little while because they aren't alphabetized, but it's still so interesting to go flip through those laws because you never know what you're gonna find and how they loop some of those laws together are pretty interesting. I think my favorite is an act regarding to boats, horses, and I think ducks is the other one. Mm. Huh. All the barnyard animals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think they're worried they're going to all steal a boat. Mm -hmm. Oh, they also have to talk about deer season, too. Oh, when do you go deer hunting? That's important. Mm -hmm. And so each person is bringing their ideas, and then they're petitioning. They're trying to get these laws passed. And there are all kinds of laws that govern us, uh, even at the, the county court. You know, we don't want folks taking things that don't belong to them. You got to go to court for that. Uh, and so the ideal is that all of these laws, that's what keeps this government working. Mm -hmm. It keeps us, make sure that everybody is doing what is necessary so we can operate as a colony. These were some really good questions that we got uh, so far, and I'm sure we'll get a few more as we talk about primary sources. Um, primary sources are a great way to discover the past. And here at Colonial Williamsburg, we learn a lot about our history from studying them. Primary sources are artifacts or first-hand accounts directly from the time period that is being studied. Today we're going to look at a very important primary source document that stated what the rights of the people would be following our break from England, the Virginia Declaration of Rights. This is a document that was written following Virginia's uh, vote for independence in May of 1776 and it was formally adopted June 12th of 1776. Why was this declaration necessary and what does it actually say? So the Virginia Declaration of Rights is one of the very first documents that we put out establishing the state of Virginia. Um, we list our reasons why we're separating from the king, why we're declaring independence. Um, it's a framework and a list of guidelines and rules that we're gonna put forth. Um, who's eligible to vote? What rights do they have? How are jury trials going to work? Bail, all of the nitty gritty details of government are outlined in it. Um, and it was important as a starting place, a stepping stone to create further change. Let's, uh, the, oh. I was gonna say the, the Virginia Declaration of Rights comes from the Magna Carta. It comes from the English Bill of Rights. So all of these ideals of rights are already here. And when they began to think about that separation, they said, we better write something down too. Mm -hmm. And the primary author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights is Mr. George Mason. Mason. Mm -hmm. And so he's that primary person that said, we better write something down, things that, um, that will relate to what's happening here in Virginia as we're about ready to step into a revolution. Um, a lot of the language or words we're using, um, you will find are lovingly borrowed in <laughs> other documents. Um, the Declaration of Independence has a lot of very similar phrases and words. Um, so I think we, we would like to share some of our uh, favorite phrases and articles from that too. Well, then what did, uh, I think we'll, we'll start with the very first article, um, which we will put up on the screen and uh, talk through um, kind of what that actually really means in non-official uh, legal document ease. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Article one states this, that all men are by nature equally free and independent, and they have certain inherent rights that when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact derive of the vest of posterity, namely the, the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Boy, that sounded good, didn't it? <laughs> good job, Mr. Mason. But understand what he's saying is that all men are by nature equally free and independent. And think about that, that term at this time. Is it truly all men or is it some men? And does it include women? Does it include the indigenous people? 
And so when you use such a broad term, and they said enter into a state of society, mm -hmm. Maya, what does that mean? So entering into a state of society means that when you are, well, considered a part of society. So that is how they are excluding enslaved people. So, you know, we're promised rights to life and liberty and happiness and safety once you have entered into that state of society. So that is excluding the enslaved people who are not considered a part of society. They are being considered property. Do you think that the enslaved agree with that decision? What do you think they were thinking? What do you think? I don't think uh, so. No, no. Don't think I think they're probably... It's, it's important to yes. think about that the majority of people living in Virginia in the 1770s are not a part of this new government that we're creating. Mm -hmm. they're, they have an opportunity in the next few centuries to actively participate, to vote, and do all these things. Um, but from that very first article that you pointed out, we're establishing this is who has rights, this is who can participate, and here's who can't. Mm -hmm. Going back a bit to the point of representation, I think that's a very important thing to show the dangers of leaving people out or not letting them be able to come in and advocate on their own behalf. Yeah. Um, let's keep going through a couple of these articles. Uh, Kathleen, I believe you will speak on Article 4, which uh, we'll yes. put back up on the screen as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so Article 4 states that no man or set of men are entitled to exclusive or separate emoluments or privileges from the community, but in consideration of public services, which not being descendable, neither ought the offices of magistrate, legislator, or judge to be hereditary. And let's make that just a little bit more simple. Um, <laughs> it's this article is referring to a person, a group of people, shouldn't be treated as more special than anyone else. Um, the offices of that magistrate, that legislator, or this judge, those words you just saw, um, before 1776, we were talking about our governor's council were all three of those things. And the governor's council itself is an inherited position. Um, traditionally, Linwood mentioned it is for life, but if a counselor dies, then usually his eldest son inherits that job and in turn inherits that incredible amount of power. So what we're saying is in this new Virginia, we're not allowing that. We are gonna choose the best people for those jobs, no matter what job they're gonna do in this new government of ours. Good to be putting people in places on merit, um, mm -hmm. rather than just by the circumstances of their birth. Um, and I think we are nearly out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so before we go, uh, do you have any final thoughts on how the colonial government worked? Go ahead. So our 18th century government works a lot like how our government works today. So we still see it. Excuse me, goodness, a train of thought left the station for a minute there. <laughs> so we still see the ways our government worked in the 18th century working pretty similarly to how it does today, where we have that lower legislative body, we have that upper legislative body, and then a singular person to sign off on it. But we do decide to make some changes because not everything worked well for us. So we see, for example, in the 18th century that if the king or the governor said no to a bill, that was the end of that. That's something we change. So today, if the president were to say no to a bill, a two-thirds majority vote in the House overturns that veto. So we kept what we like and tossed out what we don't. And I would just say, rather than talking about the colonial government to every person watching, it doesn't matter how old you are, age ain't nothing but a number. <laughs> um, even if you're not 18 and you're not able to vote, you have a voice and that voice matters. Um, write to the people who represent you in government, your representative, your senator. You have an idea, um, like we were saying earlier, you never know where that idea is gonna take you. So just make sure that your opinion is heard if you think someone can help you, then ask them for help because you never know what changes in the government might be a result of just one little spark. Um, one day you will be part of this government. You will be able 
to vote, you will give, it, give your opinion. You are the future. And so what we would want you to think about is that not everything begins in 17 and 76. It has tradition. But understand as we march into a revolution and everything is about ready to change, we need you as the young people to assist us in making that change. Uh, you will become a part of this story. You are a part of this story. And so when you look back and you think about the past, go back, talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents. They'll tell you a little bit about history and think about the fact that as the United States of America, we are still talking about inclusion. We want every man, every woman, everybody from all over to come and enjoy this opportunity to experience what this United States has to offer in the past and in the future, and you are a part of that. And if you'd like to get some experience getting involved with government, like Kathleen said, you can call and contact your representatives, but also see if your school has student government. See if you can get that no homework bill passed. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I don't have anything else to add because I think you all hit the nails on all the heads um, and said everything so perfectly as to what we want you guys to take away from this. And thank you all so much for joining us for today's episode of CW, CW Kids Ask and for sending us so many awesome questions. We encourage you to find out more about the colonial government in the 18th century by either visiting us in person or by viewing the links on our website. This program is sponsored in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Thank you to Kathleen, Maya, and Lemwood for joining us today. And don't forget to watch our next episode on February 9th when we'll, answer the, when we'll ask the question, how did enslaved people resist enslavement? Until then, have a great day. <laughs>